It's a particular honour to be invited to present this year's A.W. Howard Lecture. One of the principal problems that a geologist has when mapping an area is how old are these rocks? With igneous rocks, meaning those rocks that have crystallised from a liquid magma, it can be done by precise measurement of radioactive minerals, which will give you an absolute age. However, most of the rocks that form Victoria's basement are sedimentary rocks, laid down in an ancient, on an ancient sea floor in a 100 million year long episode that began 500 million years ago and ended around 400 million years ago. There are places where the two mix. For instance, in, in North America, uh, the graptolytic sequence has tufts interbedded in it. And these are, these are volcanic eruptions that are big enough to have material falling into oceans, settling down into a bed. That's a tuff. And this has got radio radioactive minerals in it. So you can tell the precise age of these things. Same in, uh, in uh, Norway, in, uh, in Scandinavia, they have the same. These rocks can only be dated using fossils. And this is where graptolites come in. So what exactly are these graptolites? They're quite small, mostly less than 10 centimetres across, and their most characteristic feature is the jigsaw profile of their branches, as you can see here. This slab from Willie's Quarry near Wood End shows at least half a dozen different species, other than the big one, which can be seen hiding in the branches. Like these V-shaped ones here, Isograptus and Paraisograptus. This big V-shaped one here, also a different species of Isograptus. These oval ones here, Philograptus, and this much more slender and smaller specimen here. These are typical of Victorian graptolites in that they lie flat on bedding planes in the shale. However, there are places where you find graptolites that are much better preserved. In some limestones, for instance, the original material that housed the graptolites can be preserved in 3D and they can be dissolved out with acid. This shows that the colonies are constructed of simple tubes, which are the branches, with small overlapping tubes on one side of the branches, giving access to the outside. Hence, the entire structure is called tubarium and the individual branches are called stipes. From such simple beginnings, it's of course obvious that there is scope for enormous variation. These are tuberia of six different species, six different genera, using the number of stipes and the pattern and spacing of branching as identifying characters. In this sampling here, the branching pattern is much clearer. Seven of these have only four terminal stipes, but all have completely different appearances. The cicula is where it all began. It's the first structure formed by the zygote. It looks a bit like a witch's hat, or for those of you who've never met a witch, a traffic cone. It's tiny, rarely reaching two millimetres in length. By convention, it's always shown with the pointy end up. The other end is open, and this is where the zooid was able to communicate with, with its environment. The primordial butt that lived in the, in the cicula gave rise to daughter zooids, which built their own little tubes. And these are called theci, Latin for cups, and so on, thus building the entire tuberium. This slide shows a biserial graptolite, meaning that two stipes are joined like that, grow upwards. The little holes on the side are called the apertures. These structures here are the theci, in this case, another one here, another one there, and the slits in between are sequel apertures, which is where the zooids were able to protrude and send out feeding apparatuses like here. Where did they actually come from? Did they just all of a sudden explode on the scene or were there, uh, were there sort of they, precursors? Actually, they arrived in the Cambrian and we have the, the earliest ones in the Cambrian, in, uh, at Monageta, for instance, okay. and at Heathcote. Uh, uh, the same faunas. Are Archaeolo they simple? No, well, they look a bit more like, they actually look like hydras, the modern hydras. They're sort of uh, related to, to corals.
and they're, they're thought to be the ancestors, but we don't know what, <coughs> what preceded them. Yeah, they, they're mm. not, there's nothing in the birdish shell, for instance, that looks like grapsolites. Mm. Mm. What use are grapsolites? It sound, turns out that there are quite a few things that make them extremely useful. For a start, they're marine, and they are free-floating, which meant they were distributed all over the marine environment. Quite a few species are found worldwide, which is really good for correlation. They evolved very rapidly, and importantly, they expressed their evolution in the way they constructed their colonies. These were made of tough collagen. It's able to survive strong compaction and folding. They're common in regions called fold belts, which are composed of rocks mostly deposited at great depth in the sea that have been strongly folded and deformed during mountain building events, called erogenies. Graptolites have survived all this and, oft and are often the only fossils that occur in such rocks. We use things like zone fossils to correlate, to tell like this country over there has a collection of, of graptolites and it has a couple of graptolites that we find in one of our collections and they, they immediately know that they must be of roughly the same age. And that's the way correlation works. We now have an artificial rock sequence subdivided into 30 layers called graptolite zones, each with its own label and, more importantly, its own graptolite. This is the dream of geologists. We can walk to an outcrop and if it has graptolites in it, we can determine whether it's older or younger than the outcrop down the creek. No other paleontologist can do that. They have to, they have to use a laboratory. So what can we do with this skill? Well, I'm going to show you. On this map of Victoria, you can see that the eastern two-thirds of the state has rocks that could potentially have graptolites. The Benigo Goldfield. The rocks in this region are very monotonous slates and sandstone, and the only thing that can be mapped without the aid of fossils is folds. Graptolites have been collected from the Benigo region since the middle of the 19th century, and over the years, Graptolite identifications from more than 3,000 localities have been gathered into a register. It's now available in digital form, by the way. These have made it possible to map the geology of the Benigo Goldfield. Colours range from blue, the oldest rocks, through brown and yellow, to purple, the youngest rocks in the deepest synclines. What this map shows is a zigzag pattern of plunging folds and how continuous many of the folds are. I was going to ask about um, whether we've got much more to learn about graptolites or can we apply them in any other way to... Um, I mean, correlation will be going on, but in terms of Victorian ones, um, is there much more we can, we can yeah, do now? Yeah, are, there we modern, can, we can, are there younger geologists working on we them? We can or? make more collections. Yeah. Is it, uh, one of the papers I wrote on, I found a fauna that had been made a century ago. The only location given is, is a, a, a mine, an old gold mine, mm. obviously a small one. And it's a, it's a tiny collection. It's a, a, about half a drawer, and it had several new species in it, and they were quite well, quite well preserved. Mm. And it was, it was entirely new. Uh, it was the best collection we had of a particular zone uh, and I was able to prove that all the other localities that had been ascribed to this zone by other Victorian and previous publications were wrong because it had a younger fossil. They had a younger fossil in it, which I didn't have. I had the precursor of that, the mm. ancestor of that fossil. Mm. And, and I'd love to go back to that, that spot and make a bigger collection because I reckon there's more there. So yeah, more collecting is, is the thing to do.